we are where God shows up. And so thank you guys for that. All right. Just in case you missed it, uh, last weekend, we started our new 12 Powers film series this summer. Last week, Reverend Gordon kicked us off this, with a series with Indiana Jones, who was here last week. Do you all remember? You guys were here. We started off with the power of faith. Faith is represented by the disciple Peter. I have a special fondness for Peter because, like many of us, he didn't start out with strong faith. It's something that we've learned and developed along the way. And if you're new to unity, there are 12 powers that provide us with a system of spiritual growth. And as a student, I have to know all those powers. Do you all know those powers yet? <laughs> We're working on it. Yes, me too. So there's wisdom, love, strength, faith, imagination, order, understanding, will, power, zeal, release, and life. And now each disciple represents one of those powers. Last week, we focused on Peter and the power of faith. Today, we're turning our attention to the power of strength. This week's movie, as you can see from the poster, um, highlights this power. The disciple associated with strength is Andrew. And just like the development of faith in Peter, strength is the quality we cultivate through our experiences and challenges. As we continue with our 12 Powers film series, I encourage you to reflect on how these powers manifest in our own life. How do you find strength in difficult times? What you build and maintain with your inner strength. Through these reflections and shared journey, we can grow spiritually together. Strength is often seen as a physical force, but true strength, which is demonstrating our own power, is the quiet inner confidence, non-resistant, and the ability to keep our center. Strength is also the balance between our thinking and feeling, mind, intellect, and intuition. It is the balance between the balance at at what at a, what we what obtain. So balance, excuse me, let me do this again. We obtain when we connect our head to our heart. So, and our heart, the strength as we read about in Isaiah 30, 15. For thus saith the Lord God, in returning and rest shall be, you shall be saved in the quietness and trust or confidence shall be your strength. Strength is patience. It is calm, centered, endurance. Strength is persistent courage where we all had the experience of needing to take a deep breath, face our fear, and do it anyway. This is strength. Demonstrating courage when we, we saw Indiana Jones put his hand on his heart last week and step off the cliff, we, he was demonstrating faith and strength. Because of that strength, demonstrating courage and the disciple for strength is Andrew. The, the Greek meaning of Andrew is strong man. Intriguingly, Peter, the disciple of faith, and Andrew were brothers illustrating the relationship between faith and strength. Faith and strength helps us see the bigger picture, to see beyond ourselves and to meet the challenges successfully. It's easy to practice our principles demonstrating our beliefs when things are going well, isn't it? it is, it's easy to be strong when employment is low and our houses are worth more than our mortgage. It's easy to believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God when we're healthy and things are going our way but it's precisely when none of these connections are present in our lives 
that we have the opportunity to actually practice what we say we believe. To practice our faith, we remain strong in principle to, to be grateful for what is instead of complaining to what it is not. Power of strength is often associated with the lower spine or the, or the, the back. The healthy spine is strong, firm, hold an, um, holds us erect when we are, and we are flexible enough to bend over and move. It reminds me of the palm tree blowing in the wind. The hurricane wind, it bends, but it doesn't break. This is the true nature of, of strength, firm and flexible. True strength is grounded, firm in principle, and flexible in demonstrating strength, grounded, firm in principle, and flexible in demonstrating the principle. For thus saith the Lord God in returning, and rest you shall be saved in quietness and trust or confidence. So, what are we returning to? What are we trusting in? When we need strength, we return to the silence. We go within, we trust in our higher self. Our inner wisdom, that's what we trust in. That's what we learn from. Now here comes our sci-fi reference for this morning. It's from Dune. Frank Herbert I will face my fear, I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it's gone past, I will turn that inner eye to see the path where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I will remain. Strength knows that after fear has gone, you and I will remain. Strength also helps us to do the difficult things. In the book, Jesus, the CEO, but written by Laura Beth Jones, she tells us, Jesus did the difficult thing, so you and I can do the easy thing. Her definition, one definition of a professional, she says, is someone who does things when she or he does not feel like doing them. In other words, a professional is not blown about by the winds, the of the moment, professionals, she says, stays focused on the successful accomplishments of their mission and do the difficult thing. Many charismatic and popular leaders get into trouble when they cease doing the difficult thing in order to win approval or to be liked. Politicians who depend on opinion polls to determine their actions do not last long as leaders. Unfortunately, if you run your management program based on opinion polls or popularity contests, you will not last long as a leader. The tendency of the masses is towards mediocrity, says Oldius Huxley, and opinion polls are in favor are in fear, inferior sources of vision. Failing to do the difficult thing eventually will get you into trouble. It is so important to maintain that connection with our own inner knowing. Doing the difficult thing means not letting public opinion sway you from your heart, gut, spirit, or instinct is telling you. Peter tries to stop Jesus from going to Jerusalem. He sensed danger there, and he was right. However, Jesus knew as part of the larger plan, so he set his face towards Jerusalem, even knowing the consequences. It must have been difficult for Jesus to say no to people. The whole essence of Jesus is for him to say yes, but he did say no. He said no to the ambitious young man who wanted to follow him. He even said no to his mother when she was trying to interrupt his teachings. Doesn't Jesus know not to say no to your mom? He said no to Judas about turning to violence, and he said no to temptations in the desert. 
He said no at times, even to himself. No, I will not run from this, he says. I will drink this cup that, I, that is placed before me. Jesus did the difficult thing so we can do the easy thing. Jesus did the difficult thing because he had that calm confidence from connecting to his source. Jesus knew, as did other great leaders like Abraham Lincoln, that you can't please all the people all the time. And when you're faced with complex duties or decisions, Jesus got quiet. In returning and rest shall you shall be saved. Throughout the pages of the New Testament, we read of Jesus going off to be quiet, to return to God, to himself, to restore his strength. Jesus knew the quietness and trust shall be your strength. That brings us to the movie, The World's Fastest Indian. The Indian being a motorcycle. This, motor, this, motor, this movie stars Anthony Hopkins and chronicles the passion of Burt Monroe, a New Zealander who, when in the, the movie opens, is living in a cylinder block house. Anybody seen the movie? I just saw the movie last week. It was actually pretty good. I actually looked up the biography of this, of this man, and it's fascinating. Go home and Google him. And Burt, Burt Monroe was an eccentric, brilliant, focused, dedicated man. The movie focuses on his passion to travel from New Zealand to Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah to break records with his old Indian motorcycle that he had built and rebuilt for 25 years. With this motorcycle, he has won many records in New Zealand and Australia, but his dream was to get to Utah. The Bonneville Salt Flats is the mecca for these records wanting to break records, racers wanting to be, break records. His neighbor did, neighbors do not exactly appreciate his bizarre, unusual behavior either, especially when he revs up the engine so early in the morning. <laughs> Bert, was, Bert had become friends with a neighborhood son named Tom, who looks up to him as a kind of hero worship. Did I tell you that Bert is an eccentric? And his neighbors have difficulty understanding some of his more, shall I say, interesting habits. For instance, he goes outside every morning to pee on his lemon tree, insisting that acts as a fertilizer, and that's his attempt to actually give back, to recycle. Or what about his grass when his grass was too high? And instead of mowing it, he set it on fire. He was thinking that he was being the neighborly thing until the fireman showed up. Of course, Tom, the young man, thought, thinks that he walks on water. Through the movie, he really, we really do see that Bert is an eccentric, but he's passionate. He's a passionate eccentric. In one of the opening scenes of the movie, we see a shelf of engine parts. I realized that they were all old pistons. You see, Bert melted down old parts of other engines, carefully crafting his own pistons. Under one of the shelves is a collection of old engine parts labeled an offering to the God of speed. He just kept fine tuning these parts, rebuilding them. This motorcycle over and over and over again, you know, persistence. After all of this, the rest of the movie is about his, his journey from New Zealand to Utah. One of the things that I love about this movie is that there really are no villains. There are humans, behave, they're behaving badly, and there's humans who, you know, behave with incredible generosity. There, even, there was even a club in his hometown that helped him to raise money for his pas passage to Los Angeles. He also mortgaged his house, which probably isn't worth anything, but the bank wants to help him. On the ship across the ocean, he serves as a chef cook and a dishwasher to pay his fare. Throughout his journey, he accepts the help of others. 
But you see, he asks for help too. None of it slowed him down. He doesn't obsess over the, the bad guys more than the good guys. He takes it all in. He has this quiet confidence. He's just, he just keeps taking that next step towards to his goal. He doesn't waver in that journey. From the time Bert arrives in California to get to where we call the holy ground, the Bonneville Salt Flats, people are bending over backwards to help him. At the hotel, Hollywood Hotel, Bert was surprised by a transvestite who helped him and was tickled to discover that he was a man. <laughs> to the used car salesman who let him rebuild the engine uh, of his motorcycle, to the Native American who gives him a turquoise emlet for good luck and some medicine for personal problems, to the lonely widow who has welding equipment and helps him put a tire back on the cart that he lost earlier. Can I just say that she also just loves to cuddle? I love these relationships Bert, form, Bert forms, everyone he meets on his journey. He is a great example of authenticity. And what you see with Bert is exactly what you get. He meets people where they are, no judgment. And in return, they accept him the same way. He has no problem asking for help. He has no problem receiving it. And this reminds me of something that I learned from a course that I took several years back when the instructor said, if you want to make a friend, ask for a favor. I think that reflects our innate desire to contribute to each other and to support one another in reaching our goals and to fulfill those hopes and dreams. Bert knew this intu intuitively. This is an essential distinction between being strong <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't mean that you don't ask for help. Sometimes the most vital thing we can do is ask for help. I said that there were any, really any villains in this movie, and that's true. However, that doesn't mean that Bert didn't have his own encounters or his own obstacles, just as we all do. He could have easily said at any point and given up in the movie his dream. Excuse me. Am I? <clears throat> he could have used all the excuses. I know them. You know them. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough. Fill in the blanks. Whatever your favorite excuse is, we could have given up. He could have given up when they told him that his motorcycle was too old or that he didn't register in time, which he didn't. That was true. He didn't. He messed up. But he kept asking for help, and the other drivers went to bat for him, and they let him race. He could have believed that he was too old, that his heart was too weak. That was also true. Again, he was popping nitro through the whole movie. We kept waiting at any point that he was going to die, but he, but he didn't. But he, the funniest part of the movie is when he was putting nitro in the gas tank. I just had a short moment there <laughs> of panic. Bert didn't give up. He had that quiet confidence in his dream and his abilities. He had that strength that we're talking about this morning. Ella Pomeroy wrote, strength is, is in a man in his abilities to hold to his selected course, to sustain his efforts. And that's what Bert did with, his, with the help from friends. There should be a song in there. He really, he realized his dream. At one point, he quoted Teddy Roosevelt. Go ahead, show the quote. Hearing lavender through our blood. Beginning of the movie, uh, that motorcycle gang um, kind of harassed him just a little bit. They kept challenging him. But when he was finally ready to go to the U.S. and bring back the Statue of Liberty, they ended up supporting him. Sorry, it's very emotional. Um, that was a very touching moment for me. 
And I wanted to share that quote by Teddy Roosevelt that he stated in that scene. That same quote we studied last year in a book study from Brene Brown. And in her book, Daring Greatly, she said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who, who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who keeps coming short again and again, but because there's no effort without error and shortcomings, but who does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who acts best, knows the end of triumph, of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Then Brown expands on Roosevelt's words, which she says perfectly encapsulates her research into why we find being vulnerable a hard thing to do. When we spend our lives waiting, when we're perfect or bulletproof, before we walk into the arena, we ultimately sacrifice relationships and opportunities that may not be recoverable. We squander, we squander our precious time and we turn our backs on our gifts, those unique contributions that only we can make, says Brown. Perfect and bulletproof are seductive, but they don't exist in the human experience. For me, it summarizes Strength is summarized by clarity, courage, persistence, clarity of purpose, the courage to fail over and over again on our way to success, and the persistence to rise up in the presence of what we may feel overwhelming obstacles. Strength does the difficult thing and dares greatly. Samuel Allman said, Nobody grows old merely by a number of years. We grow old by deserting our ideas. Years may wrinkle the skin, but enthusiasm wrinkles, but to give up on enthusiasm wrinkles the soul. I saw a little baby walking in, so I got distracted. Squirrel. Bert knew that sometimes it takes strength to maintain enthusiasm to stick to ideas and ask for help along the way. In 1967, Burt Monroe broke the land speed record for 61 cubic inch motorcycle at the Bonneville Salt Flats. He was 68 years old, popping nitro throughout the movie, and his bike was 47 years old. Throughout the movie, I kept waiting for him to die. In the last scene where he fell off his bike, after breaking the record and lying there, I thought that was it. But no, he returned to Bonneville nine times and broke three more records. Bert Monroe's soul was not wrinkled. He was sweaty, dusty, and getting old in the arena. But he had faith and strength and broke that darn record three more times. So put that in your gas tank. Take that in your meditation. Namaste.